Hello viewers, this is Mokoro Mube, a teacher of English and Literature, with a teaching career spanning 15 years. Apart from being a teacher of English and Literature, I'm a trained marker of Paper 3 NEC exams, as well as a panelist in the setting and markings of Papers 1 and 2. So, as I'm doing this video, I believe that all that I'm going to do is from a point of information, a point of knowledge, and definitely going to be helpful for candidates and pre-candidates as well as Form 1 and 2. So, welcome. Today, I would have wished that in our video we get to look at poetry and uh, getting to understand that poetry is a vast area that finds itself tested in Paper 1 as well as Paper 2. To start with Paper 1, uh, you must understand that uh, in Paper 1 it is all about performance and a performance would be involving questions like what's the rhyme scheme, uh, describe um, the rhyme scheme, uh, the pair of, you have to identify the pairs of uh, rhyming words, as well as wanting you to perform a certain lines, they'll be asking you, how do you perform, for example, line one of stanza three. So when such questions are asked, it's important to understand that it is response that much goes to performance and nothing more. Uh, many a times in the exams that have been tested in the past, it never goes beyond six marks. It ranges between three and six marks. They may look negligible, but when it comes to the overall score, they count. So it's important that a student make a good score in that particular area. Well, when looking at paper two, it is also having quite a large area to which it can be tested. One of it is when it turns out to be a question three, if in that case, an oral narrative is not set. In these 20 marks that it holds, these are the areas that are likely to be tested. There's a likelihood that you ask something on the stylistic devices, and this can range up to six marks or more, because this may be involving identifying um, the stylistic device, giving the significance and such like. It's very likely that it can range up to six marks. There could be a likelihood that you are asked about the persona in a poem, and asking the persona here will be wanting your understanding and proper um, getting of the information that the poem, the poet, or the artist is trying to present there. Therefore, the persona becomes key. And this one can only be having maybe a mark or two. In fact, it can be up to two marks because there'll be an issue of identifying the persona and telling us the illustration that could be pointing to that particular persona. There is the part of mood. And then talking about mood here, we are talking about the prevailing atmosphere in the poem. So the atmospheric, atmospheric um, uh, occupation of that particular poem is dependent on the subject matter. What kind of information is there? And this mood is derived from the choice of words, the arrangement, uh, so that we end up in the mood. Uh, uh, more importantly, there is the element of tone, which is the quality of voice in a poem. So the quality of voice is also to do with the feelings of the persona, this person from whose eyes or from whose voice we are getting the content. There is a way in which they are presenting this information. And as they present that information, the tone comes in. And this tone will be requiring that the right adjectives are used to identify them. So tone is significant in any kind of poem, especially for paper two. All that is to due to the fact that it is having 20 marks. We have the other part, the attitude. How do you address attitude in a poem? Attitude has to do with feelings. 
the perspective of the poet or the artist. You know, when an artist is writing a poem, they have a particular information in mind that they'll be wanting to reach the public. And this information will be kind of giving us what they feel, what their perspective of what they have is. And therefore, this is also another area that potentially gets tested. And even more, because when you're talking about attitude, it could be the attitude of the audience. It could be the attitude of you as the reader, that is the audience, or the attitude of the, uh, the persona. You know, the person from whose eyes or from whose words we are getting the information could be bringing it out in a given way such that the feelings get evoked. And that is the attitude. So actually, this also becomes very important when it comes to the analysis of poetry. However, it is important to note that mood, tone, and attitude cannot be tested simultaneously. Owing to the previous or past experiences, if there is a test on tone, then definitely attitude is left out. Mood is equally left out. So that means you don't have to belabor have expecting all this in an exam. You can only expect one. And therefore, it is only important that we have the right choice of adjectives. There could be a good reason why the three can't feature in one exam. And the simple reason is, you could have situations where adjectives overlap. You have adjectives that stand in for attitude, and you get them in tone. So if it happens that in an exam they've asked tone and attitude, it is likely to give advantage to those students who have it right, and a disadvantage, a double disadvantage, if they don't have it right. Therefore, it is important that we have that one, that one understanding that if there is attitude, you cannot expect tone. And if there is mood, you cannot expect attitude because of that overlapping adjectives that they use. So that is what we may say about that. As I go to the last bit there, themes or the subject matter in a poem. How do you get the subject matter in a poem? A poem from the definition of the best words in best order for maximum effect, you'll be understanding that we are doing the poetic work and whose structure is stanzas, unlike prose, where we have paragraphs. So these stanzas are compressed. That's why we are talking about maximum effect by use of the best words in their best order. Therefore, if you have to get that one right, it's important that the reading is done. And I'm not encouraging that we do a single reading and jump to trying to answer those questions. What we need to do is read the poem, run through the questions, read it again, and then start breaking down the information at the level of stanzas. When you look at what each stanza contains and eventually consolidate what each stanza contains, you'll be having the subject matter. I know poetry has been very unpopular with many students, but it would be one of the easiest by virtue of the comprehension that the compression of information that is there and that free license of writing in whichever way we write. You can write maybe even next to taking care of the punctuation marks as such, or even contraction, or even using unconventional way of writing grammar. That is poetry, what we call poetic license. It will enable you to even get this information. However, it's not a must that we must be able to get right each and every word in the poem. Many poets would be using some words that are relatively new to you. Ignore them. Look at the other words that you think you know their meanings well. Connect them and you'll still be having full information. Therefore, uh, it is important that the subject matter is understood because in it, it can be carrying up to four marks because you'll be saying what the subject is and then you'll be providing illustrations. Therefore, 
as a whole, it is important that poetry is taken well and understood. In case you are a new viewer, I'm kindly requesting you to subscribe or give it a thumbs up so that we are able to get notified in case of other productions. Um, I'm expecting that in the next programs, we we'll love to be dealing with each of these items, but of course with the help of questions. We'll be getting a sample poem, and then we'll be trying to discuss these particular areas, as well as this one's in paper one. That's the best way to go, and is a point of doing so many of them that we become very good students. So I hope to meet you in the next program. Thank you very much.